I'm going to continue our exploration of Waves elements by looking at where things are on the ostensibly simple one-page user interface. I say ostensibly simple user interface for a reason, and that's because Waves, to my eyes anyway, have made a great user interface in that everything required to use presets or to create your own sounds are accessible from the same page. I like it like this. That said, perhaps for version 2 of Element, it would be nice to see it develop so that each of these areas get a simple button added, or perhaps clicking on the heading here. That allows us, if desired, to flick over to a full screen view of that particular function. Anyway, maybe that's for the future. Let's look at what we have now. As you can see by a casual glance, the user interface utilizes a grid view in that each element function is blocked off into its own rectangular area. And not only that, where any of these blocked elements share a function, then it is visually bonded by a common color scheme. For example, you can see that up at the top left, the first block element is for oscillator number 1 and contains a headed gradient blue strip. And because oscillator 1 is functionally related to oscillator 2, then it too retains the blue gradient header across the top. And again, by functional association, we move to the right and tie in with the VCF, or the Voltage Controlled Filter, and VCA, the Voltage Controlled Amplifier, just below. So, even at a casual glance, we can see these functions are, despite being individually distinct, are related in terms of sound creation. We can see the same visual paradigm runs vertically at the right here where we can access global effects with another sound shaping function, EQ, below it. And at the bottom right, we see further global functions too, indicated as global and out. Moving to the left, we see the LFO section and the mod matrix rectangular area cover a little more screen real estate with an envelope 3 area here. I'll get back to what all these sound shaping functional parameter areas do in a moment and as we progress through this course. Just before I do, I'll point out the bottom horizontal rectangular strip here that contains the built-in arpeggiator. If you've used any form of hardware drum machine or sequencer, then this 16-step sequencer will be very familiar to you. So, let's look at the individual components to see what they do. I'll start by heading back up to the two oscillators at the top left of our user interface. Although, of course, you can use any of these functions without knowing exactly what they do and how they work, I think it worth understanding what they are so that you can get the most out of the presets, i.e. you can adapt them with a more informed understanding. But also, when creating your own sounds, as we'll do later, an understanding of how they operate can be quite time-saving. So, what is an oscillator? A good question, seeing as we have two. Well, an oscillator is required as the first step in synthesis because, as a simplistic definition, they produce the start sound, which then gets modified by further functions afterwards. The original sound the oscillator creates then gets electronically piped down the signal path. An oscillator creates sound oscillation, which is essentially a waveform shape, and the resulting sound is dictated by the type of waveform i.e. the shape could be a square wave shape oscillation, or a saw wave shape oscillation, or possibly a pulse wave shape oscillation. So, with the different oscillating wave shapes, we can produce distinct types of sound originally, before adapting further to modify the sound into a synthesized note or percussive hit. As you probably know, a waveform is constant and doesn't initially vary. Therefore, that waveform movement is what creates the original tone. If we look at oscillator 1 and oscillator 2 here, we'll see we can instruct the original shape by clicking on one of the type buttons here. We can choose a sine shape, a saw shape, a triangular shape, or a pulse shape. Incidentally, running horizontally underneath the two oscillators, we see the additional oscillators and mix section which allows us to take our initial oscillator synthesis and combine both oscillator 1 and oscillator 2 and also add noise and sub-oscillation and something called ring modulation. Now whilst I'm talking about this you'll have probably noticed to the right there I've put some definitions of these terms. If you want to pause this recording so that you can read through them to get a better understanding then that might be a good idea. Anyway for the moment I'll move on. 
If we move to the right to the color connected functions, VCF and VCA, you'll see the switches and rotary dials and sliders available to manipulate your initial oscillator generated tones. As you can see, the voltage controlled filter starts with a type switch that allows you to manipulate the sound by employing a particular filter. You can choose from high pass or low pass or band pass or even band reject. If you want to quickly see and hear how any of these settings affect the sound, it's probably a good idea to choose different presets initially of a sound you're familiar with. Now, I know I'm getting ahead of myself at the moment by talking about presets, but bear with me for the moment. If I load up a preset, perhaps this one, then I can see the VCF set like this produces this particular sound. Adjusting the slope between two types of pole filter means you can flick between a range of two pole with 12 decibels per octave and four poles with 24 decibels per octave. Let me vacillate between the two so you can hear the change in sound. Here we go. Now there are, as you can see, a number of other adjustable parameters here too, which we'll get to as we progress. But if I choose another preset, this one for example, then you can see how these parameter changes adapt the sound. Let's have a quick listen. Just below the VCA, the voltage controlled amplifier, has a similar but slightly less feature set of sliders and rotary dials. The ADSR sliders in this section control the level of a given note from the moment it's played until its release. Now in some ways you can sort of compare this ADSR to the settings on a compressor in that A stands for attack, D for decay, S for sustain, and R for release. The attack, decay, and release are adjustable between 1 and 10,000, which relates to 1 millisecond up to 10 seconds. And the sustain function, S, moves between 0 and 100% amplitude. So with this preset we set up a moment ago, let's just adjust the ADSR to listen how we can control or modify our sound. Here we go. Okay, so that's where things are in terms of most of the top section functions, such as the oscillators, etc., as we've just looked at. What I'll do is I'll finish up here, and in the next tutorial, we'll continue our investigation of what's on offer on this one single page user interface. See you in a second.